So again, I'm very delighted to have the chair of our scientific advisory board, Dr. Elizabeth Plimick, who is a medical oncologist from Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And she is joined by Dr. Jennifer Taylor, a urologist from Texas at Baylor College of Medicine and the VA system down there. And at the bottom of your screen, at least on the bottom of my screen, is Dr. Jeannie Hoffman Census, who is right here locally to me in Baltimore from Johns Hopkins, and she is a medical oncologist. And I'm very excited for what you all have to say. So I am going to turn off my screen and just listen. If you need anything, please let me know. And again, if you have questions, you can feel free to drop them in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. Thanks so much. Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Hi, Dr. Taylor. Hi, Dr. Hoffman Census. It's so great to see you. Um, it's been a while since we've seen each other in person, um, but we've been working with Beacon for many years, all of us. And I'll speak on all our behalf so that it is our pleasure to share some of our joint enthusiasm around new developments in bladder cancer. So I'll introduce myself and then I'll have Dr. Taylor and then Dr. Hoffman Census introduce themselves and then we'll get right into it. So I'm Dr. Elizabeth Plamack. I'm a GU medical oncologist at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And I um, lead the Beacon Scientific Committee. Thank you, Dr. Plimack. I'm Jennifer Taylor. I'm a, a urologic oncologist at the Houston VA at Baylor College of Medicine as well. And I'm really happy to be joining you today. And thank you. I'm Jeannie Hoffman since it's like uh, Dr. Plimack, I'm a medical oncologist at Johns Hopkins and I specialize in um, urothelial cancer, locally advanced metastatic uh, as well as uh, upper tract urothelial cancer. Great, so we have a really amazing um, set of experts here to talk to you. So what we're gonna do is kind of walk through the bladder cancer continuum from diagnosis um, through early phases of the disease, the different treatments, and then to metastatic disease. And there've been developments in every aspect. So um, I'll try to keep us all on time so we can get through everything, but we will start with diagnosis and surveillance. And I know there've been some developments in that area. And Dr. Taylor, this is your area of expertise. You meet patients often when they're first diagnosed. What are we excited about in this space? Yes, um, there are a lot of things that are available to us as tools, of course, Everyone knows that cystoscopy and cytology are the mainstays of our detection for bladder tumors, but we have newer urinary tests, newer technologies that allow us to see tumors better. Many of you know about blue lights, and there's also narrowband imaging, which is another enhanced endoscopy tool that can be used in the clinic and in the operating room, and those help us find more tumors at the time of treatment, and that leads to fewer tumors coming back. So it lowers the recurrence rate, and that's really the difference that they can make. And they may also help us lower the risk of progression, so a non-invasive tumor becoming invasive. There's a lot of things being done in the research arena to innovate with the urinary tools, looking at genetic uh, urinary tests, looking at genetic markers that may be detectable in the urine, looking at genetic markers that may be detectable in the blood. Um, some other researchers are looking at really uh, cool ways to better see tumors using specialized cameras that can go in the bladder and perform ultrasound at the same time. So you can see the depth of the bladder going into the, the depth of the tumor going into the wall potentially and even some technologies using artificial intelligence and computer machine learning to see if a computer might do a better job than my eye at seeing areas that are suspicious for cancer. So some of these things are becoming more standard of care and some of these things are still not yet ready for prime time, but available in investigational settings. And Dr. Taylor, as a urologist, what is the advantage that that gives you um, in terms of what you can provide for the patients being able to see the tumors better and understand the depth? Well, it can help you counsel how much treatment is needed, when treatment is needed immediately versus we can observe this for a few months because you have something else coming up in your life and you want to put this off because of holiday or something. Um, that's one example. Another way is that we can potentially with urinary tests, as Dr. Shrek 
went into in his um, workshop group earlier, use a test instead of cystoscopy to try to postpone having to do that invasive procedure. Um, maybe if we've done a better job at clearing all the cancer, the treatment such as BCG or intravesical chemo may be able to have a better effectiveness at keeping new tumors from growing because we made sure using that enhanced technology that we got rid of all the tumors or as many of them as we could detect the first time around. So most of these tr um, technologies are trying to change how long it takes for a new tumor to grow and maybe prevent that from happening altogether. That's great. I think those are real advances and certainly um, it's been fun to see these develop. So the next topic we'll cover is upper tract urothelial cancer. So um, bladder cancer is cancer that happens in the bladder, but the exact same kind of cancer can happen anywhere in the urinary tract. And sometimes that happens up the ureters towards where the kidney is. And we are really lucky we have two experts in upper tract urothelial uh, here on the call today. It's a real area of focus and interest for Dr. Hoffman Sensitz. We'll talk to us in a minute about systemic therapy for upper tract urothelial. But Dr. Taylor, um, you were telling us uh, on the planning call about a new treatment that can go into the ureter for upper tract. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So superficial urothelial cancer that can occur in the lining of the upper tracts, including the renal pelvis and the ureters can be very hard to treat. And two decades ago, the only treatment that we could do was remove the entire kidney and ureter, which had, can have a very significant impact on someone's kidney function, of course, and their overall quality of life potentially because of that. So when the cancer is less invasive. We want to try to do the same treatments in the bladder, but they're very hard to deliver because you can't ask a medication to stay in the kidney for an hour at a time. It's going to automatically naturally flow downwards to the bladder as it's supposed to do. Uh, so there's a amazing new developed, newly FDA approved medication that uses mitomycin, which is an old um, and common used medication for treatment of cancer in the bladder, mitomycin is put into a, sus a suspension, a special gel formula that can be suspended in the upper tract for up to four to six hours. It is only currently approved for tiny low-grade tumors. It is not a, a, an option for high-grade tumors or very high-volume tumors or more invasive tumors in the upper tract. That's where we have to get back into multimodal treatment, as Dr. Hoffman Census, Census will talk to us about. But uh, we know that this is a very strong area of interest. Um, finding some way that we can lower the need to remove kidneys is really the goal. <laughs> right. Absolutely. The, the less we have to do to cure the cancer, the better. That's great. So Dr. Hoffman census for tumors of the upper tract that are not low grade and localized. Um, what are some new developments in that area? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Plamek, for the time to talk about this. So, you know, as we know that upper tract urothelial cancer is a, a subset of all urothelial cancers, much more common in the bladder uh, to occur, but it's the same tissue type, just a few, you know, inches up. Uh, so we're talking about, as Dr. Taylor said, tumors in the ureter and in the renal pelvis. It's the inside lining of the, of the kidney. Again, a tough place to get biopsy tissue, a, a, a tough place, um, you know, in terms of local therapy. So one of the um, changes in the last couple of years is, I think one, just the attention to this disease. A lot of people had not heard about protracted urothelial cancer before. Our colleagues over in Europe have done this really amazing randomized study looking at post-operative chemotherapy. It's called the PALT trial. I think a lot of people know about this trial. Um, and it showed that getting chemotherapy for patients that had a high risk tumor, so that means and a high grade tumor that was advanced into the, the structures of either the muscle or into the kidney or into lymph nodes, uh, those have a very high risk of coming back or, or metastasizing after surgery. So giving patients chemotherapy with either cisplatin, very common, very effective chemotherapy, or carboplatin for patients who were not able to tolerate cisplatin because of the toxicity, it improved what's called the disease-free survival. So it took a longer period of time for patients if they were gonna have the cancer to come back, to come back versus those patients that were randomized to just standard of care, which is observation alone, follow-up CT scans and a follow-up cystoscopy. 
So what that trial has shown is really, I think, reinforced that chemotherapy around the time of surgery, what we call perioperative chemotherapy, is safe and effective for patients with upper tract urothelial cancer, just as it is for bladder cancer. And I think more importantly, is really shed a lot of light um, and um, really brought to the forefront um, that upper tract urothelial cancer is a rare disease where um, more treatment is needed. We're pretty excited about a what's called a neoadjuvant or preoperative clinical trial that, that is just up and running now um, through one of the cooperative groups. So we and many other cancer centers work together in these things called cooperative groups. I think of it like, um, like the American League and the National League in, in baseball, but everyone kind of getting together, right, to answer these really tough questions, especially in rare diseases like upper tract urothelial cancer. So what we're looking at is giving chemotherapy instead of after surgery, after a nephrogyrectomy like was done in, with our European colleagues, but actually giving it before surgery. So essentially Dr. Taylor um, diagnosing an upper tract urothelial cancer, high grade with concern about the risk of recurrence, and then sending that patient to a medical oncologist like you or I that give chemotherapy for a living. And then the setting of this clinical trial, looking at a cisplatin-based chemotherapy with or without uh, the use of an immunotherapy to see if that can then um, advance our standard of care. So a lot of exciting things I think going on in upper tract urothelial cancer. Yeah, and Dr. Hoffman Census, I think one thing that you and I talk about a lot is, um, and and urologists like Dr. Taylor, of course, know is that seeing these patients while they still have both kidneys sometimes gives us a key advantage in terms of being able to give the treatment we prefer um, because two kidneys can help filter the chemo chemotherapy a little better than the one you're left with after surgery for upper tract. So um, working together is, is really important, I think, in our field. Uh, and most centers do it really well. I think the three of us are lucky to work at places that do. Um, but I think that's why coming to a, a center that specializes in this, or at least has a real multidisciplinary um, effort is important. Okay, so we're gonna move to another category and that is non-muscle invasive bladder cancer newly diagnosed. So for patients with bladder cancer that has not invaded the muscle of the bladder, that condition is usually diagnosed by a urologist like Dr. Taylor. Um, and there's a variety of treatments, both tried and true, but also some new treatments on the horizon for that condition. Dr. Taylor, do you wanna tell us a little bit about those? Absolutely. And I think this is a success story right now where bladder cancer treating physicians, urologists and oncologists sat down with the FDA with Beacon's help and for the last five years probably have been trying to map a, a path to try to get more drugs available for these patients. Honestly, the only drug FDA approved uh, for many years has been BCG. Even the other drugs that we use in this area are not truly FDA approved like mitomycin uh, and gemcitabine even uh, kind of more commonly used today. And one thing that happened as many people know in 2019 is there was a shortage of BCG which has continued until today. And that actually forced a lot of these bladder cancer specialists and the FDA to re-examine how uh, we can get more treatment to patients that's going to be effective. Um, so it's been an opportunity as much as it's been a, a problem to have more innovation and more ideas come forward. So there's a lot, if you look on clinicaltrials.gov for BCG naive, for patients that have never had BCG uh, who are newly diagnosed, there's a lot kind of being studied. Sometimes it's combining BCG with other medications and sometimes it's trying something different uh, entirely. And there was a study just completed this year, uh, despite the limits of the pandemic, there was very uh, robust accrual to a study called BCG Prime. It was run by the Southwest Oncology Group or SWOG. And that was done across the United States to test BCG in an, in an innovative way. Um, we know that BCG is actually used as a subdermal uh, vaccine for TB in other countries. 
And there's been a lot of science that supports the concept that that inoculation, that small vaccine that could be given first might prime the immune system to make the BCG more effective. So they did this in a clinical trial and they also uh, tested another strain of BCG to try to see if that extra, that new strain of BCG could be as effective as the standard one and bring that one available to uh, patients in the United States. So um, a little silver lining in some ways to the shortage was creating this um, kind of rapid accrual in this study and, and, and helping move that forward. Um, but the, the area of newly diagnosed BCG has not changed, I'm sorry, newly diagnosed non-muscle invasive bladder cancer has not changed that much in many years uh, because BCG has been very effective for many patients. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, you know, we get very excited about new things <laughs> as we should, um, but it's really important to measure them against what we already have and make sure that we're making an improvement if we're going to change care. So that's a really good point, Dr. Taylor. And I think it's great to see the creativity um, that's unfortunately had to evolve around the BCG shortage, but just making sure we can get these treatments to patients. So let's talk a little bit about what we call BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So this is the patient who has been treated with BCG, who still has cancer in the bladder. I know there are a bunch of new treatments in this space, um, some of which are approved and some of which aren't. Maybe Jeannie, we'll have you talk a little bit about um, immunotherapy in this space. Sure, thank you. So you know, one of the themes about kind of cancer development, and, uh, and I think it's important to kind of point out that a lot of agents that we use are developed or initially tested in patients where they may have um, advanced cancer, metastatic disease, and um, where there are limited kind of options. And once a drug is FDA approved, as we're talking about today, then um, agents can be tested into different disease states. And that's what happened in this setting. So as Dr. Taylor was pointing out, this you know, BCG unresponsive disease state was one where, you know, an immunotherapy drug, pembrolizumab, that's been FDA approved for many years uh, for multiple cancers, not just urothelial cancer, but, you know, multiple different solid tumors was tested. Um, so this was um, a clinical trial that was performed um, looking at the, what's called the complete response rate. So a urologist going back into the bladder at a certain um, time point at three months, to determine whether or not that tumor was still present, a non-muscle invasive tumor. And um, what was recapitulated was that, like we've experienced using um, the drug in the metastatic setting, that it, the drug was relatively safe and well tolerated. It had pretty similar um, side effects uh, as we see uh, for patients with advanced disease, but was an effective um, option. So I think it definitely you know, opens our toolkit um, for agents that can be used um, for patients that have non-muscle invasive bladder cancer in this certain, um, what we call a disease state. Right. It's, yeah, it's great to have another tool. Um, thanks, Dr. Hoffman Census. Dr. Taylor, um, we look to you for uh, development and, and data around agents that we instill into the bladder. Uh, we call that intravesical therapies. Um, what's new on the horizon there? Well, there's definitely been an evolution in what we use and which drugs we choose and, and what we know about their effectiveness. But I would say most uh, high volume places that see a lot of these patients, and I will say that this is a small number of patients per year for anyone's practice. That's been really the challenge in trying to make a difference in new, new drug development because any practice might see five, 10, maybe even less per year of this particular population who had BCG and their cancer continues to come back. So through efforts, combining patients, combining clinical trials across uh, more centers, we've actually been able to get more data, but several centers um, have studied what's called a doublet therapy using gemcitabine and docetaxel. Those are two chemo drugs that can be used IV but when they're put in a solution and put into the bladder, one followed by the other, that seems to be the most active or the most uh, effective current option for what we say is salvage intravesical treatment. So something after BCG, before removing the bladder, and actually considered kind of in a, in a broad conversation um, where we have to talk about that um, uh, removal of the bladder versus something that's 
intravesical chemo versus something like pembrolizumab. And there's actually a couple of other things uh, right around the corner that are going to the FDA or being considered by the FDA that are other intravesical treatments. So um, one of them is, a, is an interferon gene therapy that has actually been considered by the FDA and we are uh, awaiting their kind of final word, but most of what seems to be the holdup is something in the um, uh, shipping or the processing or the packaging or something like that. But the data was very good showing that it could be um, uh, an alternative. And we have to remember that any of these treatments, including pembrolizumab, require very, very careful and close monitoring in the clinic because at the moment where there is not response, where the cancer has persisted or the cancer comes back, then we return to that consideration of removing the bladder um, you know, without, without too much delay because ultimately that is still what we consider the gold standard. Absolutely. And I think uh, relative to that, the goal for any of these treatments we just talked about, either the pembrolizumab, which is approved, or the gene therapies, which are we hope will be approved, is to cure patients so they don't need surgery, right? So the bar is very high for these, and we have very high expectations of them. Delaying surgery may be helpful sometimes, but obviously if we can prevent requiring it altogether, that would be great. And I think the other thing to frame this space is that it uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer after BCG is highly curable with surgery. Um, and so as Dr. Taylor said, and Dr. Hoffman since it said, that's always, always an option. So this is great. We're um, really talking about some, some neat developments and I see a lot of new questions coming in on the chat. So I'm keeping track and we'll get to those at the end. Thank you for those. So let's move to yet another space. And this is muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, and as the three of us on the call know, this once the bladder tumors inside the bladder start to invade into the muscle, we see the cells in the muscle fibers of the bladder, that signals a change to all of us that we need to approach this disease a little differently. We know that bladder cancer that invades into the muscle is on the move, it wants to spread, um, and we have to take a couple of extra steps to make sure it doesn't. At this juncture, working just with putting drugs within the bladder is not enough and it requires additional treatment typically with chemotherapy and surgery. So this is where our disciplines always interact very closely, <laughs> urology and medical oncology. Um, and we'll uh, turn to Dr. Hoffman Sensitz first to talk to us a little bit about where we are in understanding um, chemotherapy or other therapies that we um, give before the bladder is recommended for removal. Sure, so this is becoming a bigger space. Our current standard of care um, as you well know, is to give um, cisplatin-based chemotherapy to patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer. You know, cisplatin is an older drug uh, developed decades ago, and it has a lot of toxicity. You know, you mentioned earlier about the upper tract space. It's, you know, easier to give if somebody has two kidneys, that translates into good kidney function. So really it is true about 50% of the patients that we meet may not be really um, fit candidates to get cisplatin. We're concerned that the risk of the toxicity may outweigh the benefit in terms of overall survival that's translated from getting preoperative cisplatin-based chemotherapy. The things that we think about that we're evaluating our patients for when we meet them in clinic, when they're referred from Dr. Taylor and our surgeon colleagues are things like their functional status. Are they able to get up every day, get out of bed, you know, up and down flights of steps, um, go, you know, get to work? How's their hearing? How's their kidney function, their cardiac function? And then finally, is their presence of peripheral neuropathy? These seem like kind of strange questions to be asking someone that has bladder cancer, but the reason is, is because we're trying to assess uh, would they be able to uh, potentially handle the toxicity of that platinum-based chemotherapy. The hope would be that as we develop new treatments, we wouldn't have to be asking those questions so much and we can think about other uh, treatments. So um, there's a new paper that just came out. One of the things that I think is not necessarily novel, but always a question that people may ask when they uh, maybe if they go to different cancer centers to get um, second opinions is how many cycles of chemotherapy is the right number of cycles. You know, I think that's still um, a question that maybe has some regional answers to it, but at least there was a um, interesting study that was re uh, just recently published called the VESPER trial, just getting a sense of the number of um, cycles that may be appropriate for patients um, getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So that that's definitely interesting. We know that um, 
you know, in terms of um, chemotherapy, um, is this a place that, um, Dr. Plumick, you wanted me to talk about the other studies or kind of leave it? Yeah, no, I think that'd be a great segue into the other studies. So obviously chemotherapy, as you said, is still right now our mainstay, but as we develop other drugs that we'll hear about a little bit later, when we talk about metastatic, we're always looking to improve that. So uh, yes, I think Dr. Hoffman senses, um, can talk about the systemic therapy and then Dr. Taylor will turn to you to talk about the intravesical device based treatment. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, again, so we know that, um, you know, checkpoint inhibitors or single agent immunotherapy drugs are really super interesting and don't have the same toxicity as some of our chemotherapies as, um, as um, you know, as uh, cisplatin based chemotherapy. So particularly for those patients that may not be eligible, um, those are candidates uh, for clinical trials in these cisplatin ineligible spaces um, in the preoperative setting. So there have been several clinical trials that have been done with pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, a combination therapy, uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab, as well as dravalumab and tr trimelumab. Not yet FDA approved, but definitely very interesting. And what is very interesting actually is that the, what we call the pathologic complete response rate of getting that immunotherapy prior to surgery, is pretty similar to what, what we can achieve with chemotherapy. So um, a lot of work in this space is ongoing and I think a lot of excitement. Um, also, in terms of combination therapy, we're seeing a lot of clinical trials, and we're seeing big clinical trials. I think this is something that, as we have all evolved, you know, in this, um, in, in, in taking care of patients with bladder cancer, that the clinical trials even that are being done compared to, you know, 10 or 15 years ago are so different. You know, we're seeing these large randomized phase three trials, and what that means is that the design of those clinical trials, um, if they wind up being positive, will change standard of care. Um, so this is pretty exciting, and there's a lot going on pretty quickly. Um, so there is a what's called a maturing clinical trial, which means it's complete. Um, we don't have the data yet looking at chemotherapy um, plus a checkpoint inhibitor called nivolumab. Um, there's chemotherapy in conjunction with um, pembrolizumab as well. Um, there's chemotherapy in conjunction with nivolumab, so all in the cisplatin-eligible setting. Uh, for patients who are ineligible to receive cisplatin, there um, is a clinical trial looking at combination with um, nivolumab and a novel agent, um, dravalumab as well as trimelumab with infortumab vedotin, which is a, um, a novel and exciting agent, um, as well as some other trials looking at infortumab vedotin um, combined with chemotherapy. Um, so exciting things, I think, coming down the path in the new adjuvant space, definitely. Yes. And just to echo your comment about there being so many trials, probably no matter where you live, <laughs> there is a muscle invasive bladder cancer trial open near you because there are just so many um, questions we're asking. And um, all of those trials that I've seen are well designed in that the control arm or the arm you might be randomized to is the standard. It's what we do now. Um, and it's comparing it to something that we hope will be new and better. So um, thank you for considering those, those near you. So Dr. Taylor, there's um, a really neat device <laughs> that we've heard about. Can you tell us a little more about that for muscle invasive bladder cancer? Yes, it's uh, called a pretzel therapy because it truly looks like a little pretzel silicone when it goes into the bladder. Uh, interestingly, it was originally developed to deliver lidocaine anesthetic into the bladders of patients with interstitial cystitis. So it's a cool transition of the technology to try to deliver chemotherapy, gemcitabine, um, and into the bladder in a slow release way to try to address muscle invasive bladder cancer in patients who are unfit for cystectomy or radiation. So far that has really been the population it's been evaluated in, but there are a lot of trials that uh, are kind of listed in clinicaltrials.gov that are using this technology potentially plus a checkpoint inhibitor as potentially a way to treat the invasive bladder cancer and avoid cystectomy. That would be really the, the, the dream, um, but it's a, um, a really fascinating kind of delivery system uh, that's called pretzel. <laughs> right. I know that's what we call it. Um, we're really excited to see that if we can, of course, put a device inside the bladder that can continuously treat the cancer, it seems like um, maybe that would work. So that'd be great. Okay, we're gonna to move to the next space. And that is 
um, the patient who has had muscle invasive bladder cancer, they've received, for instance, their new adjuvant chemotherapy and then surgical removal of the bladder. Once the bladder is removed, of course, the pathologist looks at it carefully to see if there's any cancer left in the bladder. Um, and then at that point in time, what do we do? What are we doing with patients? What are we telling them now, Dr. Hoffman says this? Um, and what, what kinds of conversations are we having and how have they changed lately? Yeah, I think this is a real, like a, a pretty exciting development. And, and I think a real time explanation of like why um, being an academic medical oncologist is so satisfying kind of at this period of time. Um, because five years ago, you know, you and I would sit with patients that have gone through neoadjuvant chemotherapy, Dr. Taylor did their surgery, they would come uh, back to all of us and talk about that post-operative pathology, um, really important, um, what we call almost like a biomarker, right, to understand was the tumor sensitive to chemotherapy? Um, did it die with the chemotherapy? Did it melt away? Did it disappear? Or did it live through the chemotherapy? Or it, did it live through the chemotherapy and even move into lymph nodes? So that group of patients that, that uh, had tumors that were sensitive to chemotherapy, meaning the tumor just melted away versus those that had persistent tumor living through chemo, a very different population of patients. And up until recently, we did the same thing with that group of patients. We gave them all a prescription for a CAT scan, which is standard of care surveillance and, and um, you know, put them on a path to, to follow up. Um, full knowing that the risk of recurrence was very different in the group of patients where the, the, the cancer persisted. Um, that was, I think, always a, a, a situation that we all found that wasn't, wasn't satisfying, right, for doctors or for patients. And um, so a clinical trial was developed to answer a question, does doing something else, you know, improve those outcomes? And in fact, it actually does. So this was a really um, exciting clinical trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine just recently, um, looking at that population of patients that had the highest risk of recurrence. So patients who either received preoperative cisplatin-based chemotherapy and still had tumor that persisted following that chemotherapy, muscle invasive disease or lymph node positive disease, or for those patients that maybe had renal insufficiency and were going to be candidates to get cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And this was a randomized trial. So half the patients received um, nivolumab, one of the checkpoint inhibitors, on a standard dose and schedule for a year. And the other group of patients were followed. Um, both group of patients you know, received the standard follow-up. And it turned out that getting that follow-up um, nivolumab for a year after treatment really improved um, overall survival in the entire population. Um, so this has become a new standard of care. And I think um, definitely a space where we have, you know, that additional conversation with our patients, you know, after surgery, it's not, you know, fit for all of our patients, but to have, again, an additional tool to, to think about and to use in an appropriate um, situation is really, I think, changed the face of what we do in the perioperative setting. Dr. Hoffman says, this, can you um, help us understand that endpoint, the disease-free survival endpoint? and the overall survival endpoints and how we look at those in adjuvant trials and, and what those mean for this particular trial? Yeah, so, um, you know, whenever a clinical trial is developed, there's certain questions that are asked kind of upfront when the statistics are being designed. So if you, you know, pop open clinicaltrials.gov and you see these big clinical trials, um, there's the different kind of points that we, you know, get to in all these different clinical trials to get a sense of whether or not um, doing something, you know, where patients have to come in and be treated and put up with, you know, toxicity and perking and all the different things, you know, is that meaningful? Um, and so this trial, I think, was meaningful in, in two different ways. So in terms of um, the number of patients who were disease-free and alive at six months, meaning that they didn't have any evidence of tumor, um, was substantially different in the patients that had, you know, immunotherapy versus those that did not. And then it also um, improved, you know, overall survival. So I think, you know, especially if a patient may have, um, so I think that these two endpoints were um, important and different in different ways. And especially if someone could um, get a treatment where, um, you know, maybe they feel good and still live longer, I think is really important. And yeah. 
Absolutely. So I wanted to hit, touch upon biomarkers a little bit now that we've talked about neoadjuvants and adjuvant in the muscle invasive space, because I think there's a lot of exciting work um, being done on biomarkers. So I wanted to make sure um, we cover some of the bladder sparing trials ongoing and also um, circulating tumor DNA. Uh, and since both of you are experts in these areas, um, <laughs> which of you would like to talk, I guess, first about um, the adjuvant work and circulating tumor DNA and how that might help us? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Scanning it to you, Dr. Yeah, no, that's, I can talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think there was a there was a, a paper and Dr. Plumick, you might be able to speak a little bit um, more to this, but there was an interesting paper done. Um, I think this is from Denmark a couple of years ago. Um, try and get a sense of um, you know can you predict whose tumors may recur before you actually see something on the CAT scan? Because by the time you do a CAT scan at three six months, twelve months, um, and you actually see something on a scan, is that the optimal time to really then be chasing disease that's come back? Um, so this concept of a blood test, um, you know, we don't have a PSA or, you know, any other kind of marker to tell us whether or not a cancer has come back, but, you know, is there a blood test that can be done to get a sense of which tumors may be more likely to come back and should a certain group of patients get more treatment than the standard treatment, you know, would, would that change outcomes? So what this Danish group did was look at what's called circulating tumor DNA, so actually being able to capture the tumor circulating within the bloodstream. Um, and those patients who had preoperative chemotherapy where the circulating tumor DNA disappeared after getting the chemotherapy, those patients were less likely to have the tumor come back. Um, so an interesting story that came out of actually a negative clinical trial, this was a, looking at postoperative atezolizumab, again, one of the checkpoint inhibitors, that trial didn't meet its primary endpoint looking at whether or not it improved outcomes you know, after um, chemotherapy and surgery, but it was really interesting to find out that then those group of patients who had presence of circulating tumor DNA and who received atezolizumab versus those who did not, those patients actually did better. And, and I think that that's a great story because that little tidbit, that, that, that piece of information that, that was observed on that clinical trial then led to a whole nother clinical trial being developed. Um, because what we like to do is really hone down and, and, and do our best to give more treatment to those patients who really are at the highest risk of the cancer coming back and maybe need it versus reserving treatment for those patients where there's no expectation that the cancer would come back. The better we get at figuring that out, then I think the better we'll do for patients altogether. So well said. Absolutely. We really want to match the right treatment to the right patient. We want to make sure they need it uh, and that they're going to benefit from it if we're going to give it. Um, and we're getting there. We're not there yet, but um, we're getting there. Another space where we ask that question, we kind of ask that in every space, but <laughs> where we've been asking that question, I'll speak to this briefly, is in the neoadjuvant space, where we know a proportion of patients who get chemo won't respond at all, and another proportion will have all of their bladder eliminated by the chemotherapy. So at those two ends of the spectrum, if we could know who those patients were, in theory, one group could skip the chemotherapy and go straight to surgery, and another group could skip the surgery and only uh, complete the chemotherapy. And that in, in a perfect world, both those groups of patients would be cured, but with only the treatment they needed. So we're not there yet, but like Dr. Hoffman Sensen said, we're doing clinical trials to try to answer those questions. Um, right now we're testing some biomarkers of response. So biomarkers that if a patient has certain uh, DNA alterations in their tumor, we may be able to predict that chemotherapy will work so well from them that they, for them that they won't need surgery. And so those are clinical trials ongoing. Um, and we have one in collaboration with Dr. Hoffman Census. There's one through the larger cooperative group. There's another one through the Hoosier Oncology Group led by Matt Galski. So um, really active area of investigation, again, to do exactly what Dr. Hoffman Census said, you know, only, only treating the patients we know need it and treating them with the treatment, um, the least amount of treatment we need to, to cure their disease. So it's um, so a little, little talk on biomarkers. So um, now we're going to turn to metastatic disease. And Dr. Hoffman-Sensitz and I 
Um, this is this is sort of our area of expertise. It's what we do um, is see patients with metastatic disease and use various drugs to control the cancer that may have spread to other parts of their body. So in this area, um, there's been a lot of a lot of development. And I'll turn to Dr. Hoffman Sunsets um, to talk to us a little bit about those studies and those new agents. Sure. Yeah, there's been a lot of development. Um, so I think one thing that we've seen is just a um, more of a um, kind of a recapitulation of um, the use of chemotherapy in the frontline space. So um, there have been a lot of clinical trials looking at combinations using chemotherapy, you know, cisplatin-based chemotherapy um, with gemcitabine and carboplatin, and then looking at the combination of then adding in um, immunotherapy. This has been a successful strategy in some other solid tumors, like in you know, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. Not, not the same success, I would say, in bladder cancer. We may all have kind of our theories as to why that is. But I think what has been made very clear is that sequencing active therapies um, continue to be the gold standard in advanced urothelial cancer. Um, so there was um, what's called a maintenance study that was done and published, um, actually done a couple of years ago and published last year again in the New England Journal of Medicine, which really showed that in patients who had um, upfront platinum-based chemotherapy who were able to get through somewhere between four and six cycles of chemotherapy, and with that upfront chemotherapy, um, were able to achieve either stable disease, meaning the cancer stopped growing, or in fact, um, a remission where the tumor um, melted down or even disappeared on the scan, that we were able to maintain that remission and continue that on with immunotherapy called Evelumab. Um, that drug was tested specifically in that space. So even though the, there are five checkpoint inhibitors FDA approved for urothelial cancer, Evelumab is the only one that was tested in that maintenance setting. And I think that really solidified, for now at least, the, the frontline therapy for patients who are eligible to receive either cisplatin-based chemotherapy or carboplatin-based chemotherapy. So that was an important, I think, development. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I think that solidified as well is that there are some patients where chemotherapy remains challenging for them, uh, but are still potentially amenable to receive treatment. And we see these patients more and more you know, in our clinic. I, I don't know about you, I've seen a lot of patients in their 90s lately, and um, you know, they're fit and, and um, eligible for, for some form of therapy. And so for select patients who can't get chemotherapy for other medical comorbidities, we can still use frontline immunotherapy alone. And for some patients, this can be um, a safe and effective treatment. So um, that is exciting, and I think um, an important development in, in the frontline space. Great. And what about after frontline? So for the patient that's had their chemotherapy and their immunotherapy, what sorts of agents um, do we have now in the clinic that are relatively new? Sure. So we have um, a targeted therapy called an FGFR3 inhibitor. Um, so that oral agent um, can be a very effective therapy. Um, that is a specific therapy for patients whose tumors have um, um, mutations or fusions in that pathway. The way that we as physicians will figure that out is in our patients that um, maybe had chemotherapy in the perioperative setting and still have residual tumor, or for those who meet us with metastatic disease, we will um, send off a specialized test called next generation sequencing. And what that test does, it gives us a wealth of information about the tumor itself. Not necessarily is this urothelial cancer or not, but what really makes this tumor tick? What are the changes and the mutations that are present that are different than, than normal tissues? So in about, depending on whether or not it's a bladder or an upper tract tumor, there may be 20 or 30% of those patients that have this FGFR alteration, meaning that those patients may be candidates for that therapy at some point in time. So again, I kind of walk around with this mental toolbox of, of agent standard of care agents, as well as clinical trials that a patient you know, may be a candidate for. And that next generation sequencing really helps us again, as you said, match the right treatment to the right patient. Um, so that is an exciting development that has happened over the last couple of years. And I think we're learning more about um, that agent. And then there's another group of drugs altogether that were developed and um, FDA approved since 2019 called antibody drug conjugates. So I think about you know, cisplatin and carboblatin chemotherapy you know, developed decades ago. I think of those drugs like 
you know, they work, but it's kind of like a, you know, the phone that was plugged into the wall that's a rotary phone, right? And and for Tumab and Sasatuzumab are like this guy, right? Um, like <laughs> a very fancy developed cell phone. Um, and I'm a very visual person. So, you know, I, I will describe these in clinic as, you know, they're, they're almost like Lego pieces that are put together. So it's a chemotherapy that's encapsulated um, and that chemotherapy is then attached to an antibody. And that antibody is almost like a, a heat-seeking missile. So it directs that payload of chemotherapy to the tumor. And what happens then is that you get this very effective chemotherapy with not the same degree of toxicity that we see um, in, in a platinum-based chemotherapy. And that has been a, a huge, exciting development. Um, we know that some tumors, if they move or metastasize to certain organs like the liver, they can be really challenging to treat. And I think it has been um, been a great development that our new agents, infratumab, sasatuzumab, and ertafitinib, they don't seem to care where the tumor is in the body. So we have all of these great selection of agents. I think now, because they've all been FDA approved at relatively the same time, we are challenged to try and decide in what sequence it's best to give them. And there, this, there may or may not be some importance to that sequence. I think that's part of what we're going to be able to figure out in the next couple of years with our clinical trials. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I share your enthusiasm for having more options. Um, and with with sort of a wealth of options comes all of these questions about how to use them best. And so I, I'm excited that we're looking to, to different sets of data to sort of answer that. So thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman Sensitz and Dr. Taylor, um, for going through sort of the new developments from the early detection onto metastatic disease. And we have so many questions in the chat that I think what we'll do is take the next 15 minutes to do that. So first I'll ask if the meeting organizers can spotlight all three of us um, so that you can see us all as we're speaking, not just me. <laughs> Dr. Plymouth, uh, can we just also go back to uh, trimodal therapy and bladder preservation? For sure. That was, I was going to use a question to jump to that. Thank oh, you yeah. so much, Dr. Taylor. I saw that come up in the chat. So one of the things that we didn't talk about, and this is again, going back to the space where um, the disease might be um, muscle invasive is the, the most common standard place for this is using uh, chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation all together in a coordinated fashion um, to try to cure the bladder while leaving leaving it in place. And so um, Dr. Taylor, there were a couple questions, one that maybe we can answer while we sort of flesh out this area, uh, one about new things in the space and the other about proton therapy and whether that is something um, that we're using in this space. Do you wanna comment? I'll try to give it a, give it a yeah. go. The, <laughs> um, the idea of trimodal therapy has been more popularly used in other areas of the world uh, for a longer time than here, including Europe and Canada. And we are now kind of coming into vogue with that as an accepted treatment, not just for patients who can't have cystectomy, but for patients who are eligible for cystectomy. And we are so excited that in the last year, a clinical trial has been opened nationwide. Um, there have been many clinical trials done in a few parts of the country for uh, a, a number of years but now there is a coordinated trial by SWOG looking at trimodal therapy uh, with or without the addition of a, a checkpoint inhibitor. And that is going to help us understand in patients who could have cystectomy, can we get similar durable control of the cancer or cure, as some would say, uh, with trimodal therapy, including that maximal TRBT and chemotherapy and radiation. Proton therapy is a version of radiation that is currently not used widely or regularly for uh, bladder cancer. What they are doing more commonly right now is trying to compress the number of doses into fewer doses by called uh, hypofractionating. So trying to deliver more radiation per treatment dose or per treatment uh, visit so that there are fewer days required, fewer trips required. And they have generally shown that re reducing the number of treatments by giving a little bit higher dose per treatment has not increased toxicity. That was the concern that if you compress the treatment, give more radiation per treatment, you're going to have too much toxicity. But truly, um, a lot of the data shows that patients who get radiation as their um, primary treatment can have good quality of life. That's one of the big endpoints that's being studied in the trial. 
And, you know, they're trying to look at living with your bladder without recurrence and without progression as the kind of end point of that clinical trial that's ongoing right now. Great. Thanks. Um, and I'm sorry, I was trying to manage the chat while you were speaking. Did you speak a little bit to proton therapy? That question came through. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Okay. So first of all, um, if people could give a wave, if they see all three of us right now, or just me speaking, if you see all three of us give a wave. Okay. So Morgan, maybe we can fix that so that we can um, make sure that we're all, we're all being seen as we answer these questions. Okay. I'm going to turn to the questions. I tried to pick them up as they came through the chat. I think now would be a good time to say, we are not giving you medical advice on your specific situation. We don't know you. We can't know the details. Uh, if you've gleaned anything from what we've said, it's that every patient's case is very nuanced. Um, so feel free to take anything we said to your doctor as a point for discussion. Um, but we are, we are in no way offering you know, specific me medical advice. So there were a couple questions, Dr. Taylor, about how we monitor sort of the trajectory of disease, low grade, low grade turning into muscle invasive, and then disease metastasizing. Um, you talked a little bit about the novel ways to see the bladder. Does that help us um, understand how, the, how and if the bladder tumor is progressing or if the bladder is still clear? Absolutely. And I was going to say when we were talking about neoadjuvant that we've been really hopeful that we can give neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then look inside the bladder and see that it's clear, send a urine, see that there's no cancer cells and say this bladder is cancer free. But that is truly not the case. We do know that patients get neoadjuvant chemo, have a cystoscopy and cytology with which both come back all clear. And then they go to cystectomy and the number of patients that still have disease in the bladder, maybe on a microscopic level, maybe a seed, a small focus in the wall of the bladder that you didn't see on, on the scope. There's still a, too many patients that have disease that we didn't pick up in our standard ways. MRI of the bladder can be actually a newer tool because it's very uh, sensitive and, and shows us a lot of detail about the anatomy. Um, I would say that in non-muscle invasive, the cysto and the cytology are still our gold standards. We do use blue light in the flexible cysto setting in the clinic, and that's being uh, studied and, and implemented more and more widely across the country and across the world. Um, but those combinations, imaging um, that we look at through the scope, imaging that we look at with a CT scan or an MRI, uh, and then some type of urine-based markers, some combination of those three are still our, our most useful and, and kind of accurate tools. Okay, um, that's great. There was a really interesting question around screening tests for bladder cancer um, and also prevention. So maybe Dr. Hoffman says I'll have you talk about things we could do around prevention of bladder cancer and Dr. Taylor, perhaps you could comment on where we are with screening. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I guess I would say I wish that we were further along than we were. I think one of the things that we definitely know is that um, most patients and most of the, you know, the friends that we see on this call um, have a similar story in that they went to a doctor with urinary symptoms, and those urinary symptoms often included blood in the urine or hematuria, and sometimes those symptoms were um, treated for something other than what was ultimately diagnosed as a bladder cancer. And part of that is because common things happen commonly, but at the same time, um, I think one is an awareness that um, you know, gross hematuria is never normal. Microscopic hematuria is not a normal thing. Uh, it needs to be worked up and that if someone has recurrence of urinary symptoms that they should be seen by somebody who looks at the urinary system for a living and that's a urologist. So, I think a lot of what we're doing is still trying to improve awareness kind of after the fact in terms of um, the, the correct workflows and, and um, algorithms for really where patients with hematuria um, need to be evaluated and how they're evaluated. I think if anybody, the group here at BCAN has done you know, so much to raise awareness for bladder cancer. Um, so thank you to Stephanie and to Diane and to everyone you know, for all the work that you've done. I think there's still a lot to, lot to do and, and an entire field can be dedicated um, you know, to screening and surveillance, absolutely. 
And Dr. Taylor, any more comments? I mean, of course, we we all get colonoscopies and mammograms yeah. and PSA tests as screening for other types of cancer. Um, is there anything that we can do to screen for bladder cancer or not yet? I would make two comments. One on the prevention side is that we can educate people that bladder cancer is a smoking related malignancy, a smoking related cancer, and try and change the rates of smoking and make people aware of that. Also occupational exposures, pesticides, um, some other things that depend on where you live in the country that get into your groundwater, those can affect our risks of bladder cancer and making people aware of that. Um, certainly just recognizing uh, that hematuria is a big signal that in indicates a risk of bleeding. We need to continue educating our colleagues who see patients before urologists see them. Um, and then in terms of screening, there is still a big difference in patients who are at risk for bladder cancer based on their history and their exposure risk and patients who are not. So in using something like even urinalysis, it doesn't make sense to do a urinalysis on everyone to look for bladder cancer, but a lot of people get a urinalysis and it shows blood. And then there are ways that we can say you have a higher risk or a lower risk of potentially finding something bad like bladder cancer. And we can send you to urologist or have, have you be sent to a urologist earlier um, than, um, so that difference is say a 65 year old who has smoked and a 40 year old who has not smoked. If they both have a urine test that shows blood, the 40 year old may not need to go on the very first occurrence of that, but the 65 year old who smoked definitely should. And that's called risk, risk-based guidelines. So using risk to kind of tell us who should get worked up sooner is really important. That's great. So it sounds like we're actually doing the testing. <laughs> Patients are coming in with blood in their urine. We just need to smooth the pathways so that those are picked up upon and acted upon when appropriate based on what you said, which is great. Um, okay, so many questions. I'll try to get to all of them. Um, two that are coming up. One is that I'll pose to Dr. Hoffman since it's Talk to us about the sort of process for getting these agents that are exciting, that have a positive trial, that then go to the FDA, that then get approved, and then get ideally covered by insurance. And if there's a gap between FDA approval and insurance coverage, um, what is a patient to do? We have another hour. <laughs> I know, we don't. Um, maybe briefly in one minute. I think I think yeah. the reason Dr. Hoffman says it says this is this is such a difficult situation. Everyone's situation is different, but maybe we can give some general guidance. Yeah, I, I think that, I, I think like a, a quick on the back end of the second question that you asked about is there a gap between FDA approval and insurance clearance? The answer is yes, though there always kind of is. It's usually on the order of days to weeks. Um, I, I can say that, you know, the newer drugs that have been approved and for Tumab, um, they even in general been, F, been um, approved by insurance, you know, av, as a checkpoint inhibitors, a few here and there have not. Um, we know that oral agents are looked at differently than insurance companies. And, and we know this from other GU malignancies that some of us treat. So for prostate cancer and kidney cancer, there's a lot of oral agents, insurance companies can look at those differently. So that's always a challenge, and that is unfortunately not something that I think we can get into too much today, but a challenge that we, in most part, know how to overcome. How kind of on the front end do these um, agents get into clinical trials? How do we look at this space? That's what we all kind of do every day is say, you know, boy, I wish we had a better answer for fill in the blank. And when that thought crosses your mind, that usually is a clinical trial right there in development. And so then it's years of having discussions with other colleagues, statisticians, uh, basic scientists, doing some bench and mouse work, um, talking to you know, pharmaceutical companies, some of them you know, may be with us today, and then working through these ideas and then you know, getting them in front of people. These, can, these ideas can take years you know, to develop and to get up and running, but the pace has changed dramatically. And it is just so exciting, I think, to be working in this field today. Oh, absolutely. We'll um, try to squeeze in one last question and maybe it has a really quick answer. Dr. Taylor, have we tried uh, intravesical um, checkpoint inhibitors yet? As far as I know, we have only tried the combination of an IV or intravenous checkpoint inhibitor mm -hmm. and an intravesical treatment. So BCG has been studied in conjunction with pembrolizumab, and there's a lot of different things being proposed, and you can find it on clinicaltrials.gov as well, because there may be some 
a rationale, even at a kind of testing level or a pre preclinical level that the checkpoint inhibitor may make the intravesical treatment work better. But so far putting it into the bladder is not, um, prime time to my knowledge. Correct. Yep. That's my understanding as well. It's a very fragile substance, these antibodies and the bladder is a little bit inhospitable for them. So, um, people I'm sure are trying it, but nothing that we've seen yet. So we are right up on the hour. I cannot thank the two of you enough. Uh, your expertise has been tremendous here. Um, I really thank you for sharing it with our patient community. And I really want to thank each of the patients who took the time to log in and listen to us today. Thank you. A lot of you asked questions we didn't get to. I would say, write it down on a piece of paper and take that to your next doctor's appointment. Your doctors are there to answer your questions and they're all good ones. Um, and they're all, all fair game to ask. So we hope that next year we can um, sort of roll out a whole new slew of developments and we know the progress uh, isn't fast enough, but it is happening. Um, new things are coming and we hope to get them, you know, to the clinic to help patients and folks like you and your family members soon. Thank you.